Oh, here he is. Hello, John. Welcome, John Taffer. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. Good to see you buddy. How are you? Oh, my God. I was just watching the premiere of Bar Rescue last night. What did you think? What an episode to start with. You always, you always worry, especially with a show like Bar Rescue. Like that's a show that you, at any moment, you worry. You could see how that show could jump the shark, right? Like it starts to get hokey or set up or whatever. And I'm watching it, and like, what a disaster! When you walked in, what a disastrous group of people you walked into. It's uh, so, that's why I keep doing it. So I, I start my 160th episode next week. Wow. And what's the reason why I do it is it is so freaking entertaining because I'm never sure what I'm walking into. Right. And, right. And, so uh, you prefer you, probably when it's a mess and you have something to actually do. You don't want to walk course. into a good place. Well, as a host, obviously, there's low-hanging fruit when you walk in sure. to a place like that. There's a lot of things I can cover, you know, but when you walk into a perfect operation, you don't have that. But perfect operations don't typically... They wind up having you. me there in the first place, sure. Let I me... saw one from season five where it was like, I was watching it last night too. It's this lady, you would have hated her, Jim. It's this lady and she's just crying the whole oh, episode. yes, yes. She's, and and oh, Taffer, poor dear. Taffer oh, has yeah. to be like, look, I, it's not even like a typical bar rescue episode because you're just like, you just have to leave because I have to reconstruct your whole bar. Like I have to redo the floor. I have to get yeah. everything new. I have to get construction that was a people freaking in bummer. here. You know what the greatest story though for me from a host standpoint was an episode I did in Orange County, California with a couple from the Dominican Republic. His name was JP. Her name was Edith. This is absolutely true. And uh, uh, I get a one minute briefing before the show. So I'm told it's a husband and wife. They're not getting along well. They're in debt like 400 grand. She's ready to kill him. She thinks he's cheating on her, et cetera. Okay, get my makeup on and get in the SUV. The wife sits down next to me in the SUV. She has a gift bag with her. And I say, oh, what's in a gift bag? She goes, oh, it's a gift for my husband. It's our 14th anniversary. I go, ah, oh, what'd you get him? She goes, divorce papers. <laughs> Wow. It's completely true. I remember this one. So, so yeah, then yeah, yeah. we sit there, we look at the video monitor together, and so a couple of girls go up to her husband, and they're hitting on him. They say, you married? He says, yeah, there's no ring on this finger. And she's watching this. Wait, did she me. set it up, or how did she get that footage? Oh, no, we're watching it live. So I'm sitting in the SUV outside the bar with her. In the, okay. in the bar for, like, days leading oh, up to this. Oh, what a... Did he, so, the car just forgot the cameras were there, I guess. Oh, they do. You know, we leave here a day and a half, and they forget it, Jim. It's unbelievable. And, and obviously, they have to forget it, because you would knack the way on national sure. television <laughs> so so uh, we're watching this and she goes that's it that's it i've had it so i i talked to her and i said listen if you're gonna go do this go in and be bold i got your back this is your chance to change it and if you saw it she goes in rips his shirt throws a drink drink in his face and belts him in the mouth wow <laughs> so they have they want to get divorced uh, so at the end of the episode <laughs> and i gotta tell you this is the dr john stuff at the end of the episode they tore up the divorce papers and about two months later uh -huh. i got an email that they had another baby wow okay so i guess uh she was pregnant and uh, hopefully it was uh, his and they lived happily yeah. ever after. <laughs> well said. confrontation <laughs> therapy i call it yeah <laughs> you, you also worked uh interesting you, you how long were you at the nfl enterprises uh, uh i was on the advisory board of nfl enterprises for about two years two and a half what years, years? Ooh, 95, 96, right in that range. I could be a year off. Oh, okay. So yeah. the whole, I, was, I wanted to ask you about the whole concussion thing. Uh, yeah. If there was any talk about that back then or no? No, not really. You know, the big issues back then were more domestic violence issues, programming issues. Back then, the Dallas Cowboys was trying to do their own logo sales, right? And they were trying to step away from NFL properties. Why? Because they have a, to split it? Is that what it is? They exactly. Have to they, were on, they, they were a huge percentage of logo sales, but they were getting a smaller distribution because obviously it's slanted. A lot of the dollars go to Green Bay and teams that perform less in logo sales. So uh, there was that going on at the time, and that was a pretty heavy issue. So there was a, a lot of pressure. Do you so think Adele's a good issues. commissioner? No, I don't. And, and and the reason why I don't is 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 a couple of things. I mean, you could you could latch on to a few different things, but you know the one that I latch on to the most is when you lose control of a place. I mean, you guys can't come in here and do whatever the hell you want to do. There's some rules, there's some regulations. You can't be so offensive that you alienate half your listeners. Right. NFL we can be so bad that we alienate them. We just can't be offensive. Yeah, we can, yes, we, we yeah. can be so terrible we've lost 80% of them. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, you can, you can do it naturally. Or you sure. can do it too. Uh, so, right. so you see my point. So what's happened is look at the ratings situation. Look at what's happened you know, to the brand equity, to the ratings, to the cash flow. So if you were an advertiser on the NFL, you'd be pissed right now. Oh, and yeah. You'd say, you'd say to you, your responsibility is to, to deliver me an audience. 
How much right. of that is rule changes, though? Like, is it because that there's so many penalties and they fe- people figure the game has changed a little bit and it's gotten softer? But then again, the NFL's in a weird position because they get all these concussions happening and all these injuries and there's a billion dollar settlement. So is it the NFL's fault, or is it just kind of people are finding other shit to do? I think I think it's two. I think okay. millennials are not watching sports at, at the base at the level that the generation before them did. But I also think there's something I'm going to simplify. There's so much of likability when when there's disrespect of the American flag, whether you like it or you don't. A certain people say, "I don't like that guy for doing that." When you step out of the box of respect and normalcy, there's always a certain amount of the population that says, "I don't like that guy." Right. Whether it's, uh, and I'm not suggesting it's right or wrong, and, and people can land it's on either side of it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. statistically, you lose a large part of your audience. And above. You don't watch people that you don't like. So what's happened is they've taken a game that used to be all about plays and strategies, and they've made it about politics. And by doing so, you, you inherently alienate. Look at what happened in the Oscars this year. They had terrible ratings, The right? greater infusion of politics to lower the ratings. Right. People don't like it, That's across the board. Yes, we want to watch football, man. You know what I'm saying? We want to know these guys as football gods. Right. And their opinions really don't freaking matter at the end of the day. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you think of some. People just want to kind of enjoy it. They don't want to be preached at. And right. it's an escape, man. <laughs> you exactly. Know? You want to watch football. So, so, so I think the infusion of politics and all this stuff at the end of the day is very alienating. Do you and think you don't he build handled an audience like that? Did, I, do. did, I, I don't like Goodell either, but I mean, did, is there anything else he could have done what else could he have done when the president stepped begin going you should fire these bumps well i don't, I don't, you know, I don't think that's reasonable either but i, I think either. i think what you do is you meet with the players association you say listen guys if we lose audience we're all in trouble so we have to come up with a way for you guys to make some kind of a statement do an event if you want off the field you know figure this out but during the time allotment of national television for football we have to understand we got to drive ratings and as a commissioner, you got to figure out what the rule is and stick by it, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's that's really what a big problem was. He was totally wishy-washy on if exactly and we'll right. do this, we'll do that. And the but he's wishy-washy were, on a lot of stuff. Yeah. And, and I think that that's where, you know, he's not the greatest. He and and be I hate him. Distinct. Yeah. But I think in that one, he was in a really tough position because it's racial. And it's like, uh, but then again, if you side with the players who a lot of them are, are black, then you're pissing off the police and all these military. That's a really shitty no, position. To be no in. other sports yeah. league has had a problem with it, though. No, but they, for some reason, none of them have... Um, I don't know why. It's because I, they enforce whatever rule is there. Everybody knows what the rule is and just accepts it. And it's not like this thing where it starts where you let one guy go, okay, well, if that's, yeah, he can do that. We don't really enforce that rule. Well, then now, now there's people over here. Well, now we are going to enforce it. We can't now. Okay, well, then we won't. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. There's a culture in each are. team that you yeah. don't step out of the box either. That, yeah. you, that, you know, you stick to the rules to some degree. Right. Yeah, maybe so, this is fault. So yeah. when you talk about likability, is it in your head when you're doing a bar rescue show, do you go like, Okay, like I was really severe because that's how the shows always begin severe and hopefully you get to a positive place Sometimes yeah. you don't but yeah. hopefully you do like do you go after a day or something of shooting? Do you go like okay? I gotta admit, I've got to be cool today because I got to show this other side of me because if I'm on TV for an hour Just shouting there's gonna be a huge population that doesn't like me Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you say that because I've never had that thought Really? While, while making a show, ever. Yeah. You know, I, I just tend to go in there and do what I have to do. Mm-hmm. And it's the cameras disappear to me. I'm not saying I don't know they're there, but they disappear. It becomes you and me, right. so to speak, in each other's You're eyes. You're putting on a show for the camera. And, and no, I can't do that because right. you'll know it. Mm-hmm. And it gets really, really fake. So if I'm screaming and yelling, I, I'm, I'm fucking pissed. <laughs> sure. And, and here's why I'm pissed. And, and, you know, we've sort of talked about this in that I'm given four days to do something that would normally take me four months. Right. So I'm under a lot of freaking pressure, man. There's this clock ticking in my head. And if you're not jumping on board, I got to make you freaking jump on board. So it gets heavy for me because if you don't move at the pace I want you to, I'm going to fail. And oh. that ain't cool. And it's got to look, it, it, you have to get, a, how, how about getting permits and all that shit? Like when you have to get something built, you have to a lot of times go to the city, local we government. Do. So, so how do you do that in four days? Or do they come back and reshoot when, when they're... Well, we have to get a filming license, right? Which in essence is a movie production license because it's a set and we have generators and tr- five trucks. We have a crew of 57. I have carpenting, uh, carpenter uh, tents and everything. By the way, if you guys would like to come to an episode and do recon, I'd love to oh, have you. That would be fun, man. I would love to do that. I'd love to have you guys do it. We'll you know, do you it. can actually see it yourselves. Let's make that happen. Sure. Absolutely. But, but uh, 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 so we through that movie licensing, we have the ability to build things on a temporary basis but we don't leave it temporary so we know we can create now we have to go see the building department which we do about a week before okay the challenge is we don't know what we're building till i get there a week later 
So uh, the cities have to work with us. So you kind of set don't. up possibilities. Like, hey, yeah. it may be new flooring. It may be this, but we'll... Yeah. we'll, but uh, it's also, we'll and Jim, we don't do structural stuff. Right. You know, I'm not going to move a structural wall. I'm not going to move electrical, because I can't do that in 36 hours anyway. Sure. And I so, guess So I, that makes a difference. Okay. I guess the city would want to work with you, because ideally, if it's Taffer coming in and it's going to be on Bar Rescue, like, this is going to drive the economy. It makes a better. difference. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. it's funny, you know, it's interesting. When we come into the market, one of the first things that typically happens is we get a phone call from somebody who says, listen, uh, uh, you need to portray us right. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I want you to ignore those, you know, 170,000 murders that we had last week downtown. Or, right. Or, so, I mean, we, we, we make sure that we portray each community in a positive way, and, and uh, uh, you're right. They Which, benefit by our presence. And, I mean, that makes sense. It doesn't really hurt the integrity of the show because it's not like it, it wouldn't make sense if you were like, I'm here to save this bar. Now, this bar oh, is course. 50% married people, 70 murders happened last <laughs> year. Course. And you're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, my job is to make people root for the place. Right. You Do you know, travel out of the country or only in the States? Uh, uh all in the states, but but I'll tell you a secret that I haven't told anybody yet. Yes, we realigned our entire production schedule, and we're going to Puerto Rico next week to rescue two bars in communities that are fucking level because man. of the oh storm. wow because of the storm, and nobody's talking about it anymore. They got no power, no water, so they still don't have power. No, about forty percent of the <laughs> island doesn't. What? So the we're going has down it been? Uh, almost six months. Oh my God. So we're going down there. We're going to do a, a hurricane episode, so to speak. We're going to rescue this bar, be the first business in this community to open. Wow. And we're really excited about it. So when we can wow. steer the show to do some good, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And that'll be less about you being like, hey, you're a failure, and more just like, hey, we're here this to This is what we got to do. Absolutely. This is yeah. an Absolutely. act of God. It would and be funny if you screamed to somebody who had lost everything, though. <laughs> <laughs> we did that here after Superstorm Sandy. At the bungalow bar one, yeah. in Far Rockway, similar kind of a thing where, you know, they're not failures, but the storm took it The from storm them. fucked everything up, so That's you're right. kind of going back in to try to help them. How That's close... right. And they didn't have the money to open or the speed to open, and season was coming, so I can do it quickly. Sure. You know, and bail them out. How close have you been to getting punched in the face? Because, I mean, I've seen it a lot where it's like from a, from a viewer. I saw the premiere, you were close to getting punched in the face by the chef in the kitchen. Like... Has there been a moment where you're like, you get ahead of yourself, and then in the back of your head, you're like, oh, I don't want to get in a fight with this guy right now on television? Uh, I've, I've never had that thought either. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I've had people push. We've had a little shoving and stuff over the years. And you're shoved but, back? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Even I'm, though you know now you're a public figure. Well, I'm you, not going to punch somebody in the mouth, but right. if somebody pushes me, I'm going to hold them back. Gotcha. I'm not going to push him into a wall or hurt them. But well, how tall are you? Certainly. I'm 6'2 and a half. Yeah, he, he's not a small man. No, he's no, not. No, no, he's not. You handle it differently than I would. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, that's and, right. And John also, uses, I'm a little... his, uses his body yeah. too. Like he's got a he's got a presence. Sure, yeah. I do. You feel also, space. guys, keep in mind, I came up in the nightclub business, so I've been dealing with drunk jerks and, and aggressive people my whole life. And people so. kind of know you know what you're talking. Even if they don't like what you're saying, they can't go. Well, this guy's never done this. They yeah. know right. you've done it, and you're yeah. there to save their business. Like it's like at the end of the day, you know, I am. They're requesting you be there. Yeah, and they might not. And, and, but they, you know, once I'm there, they really start to understand, Jim, that I do care. And they they see it because I'm I'm not really fighting with them I'm fighting for them right so so they get mad but they don't get that mad yeah. also when I look in their faces and here in Queens in Sunnyside Queens they did the Fireman's Bar uh, uh, with the Gowan family and uh, that was the closest I ever came to getting belted in the mouth why a and uh, well because I was I was pretty much firing one of the brothers. Because you talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. We were face to face like that classic boxing sure. poster. And you think I'm big. Uh, Jimmy was bigger than me. Was there and, spit flying? Oh, spit was flying both ways, right? <laughs> we both get in our showers. And, uh, you know, as I'm looking into his eyes, which are right in front of me, I mean, four inches from mine, I see his pupils dilating. And that's what happens before people tend to get violent, is you'll see their pupils start to dilate. A dog and a cat, oh, wow. you know, primate, same kind of thing. So, so mm -hmm. you can see it. And, and wow, that's very observant. I would never notice that. But in well, that moment, do you have the, the mental strength to back away and realize this? Well, it, or it depends you... upon where you go. Yeah. So I'm screaming at Jim. I'm saying, you know, you're, you're an asshole. You're fucking this up. You're ruining it for your family, blah, blah, blah. And he's ready to punch me in the mouth. And then I'll suddenly say, do you want me to help you? Suddenly he doesn't want to punch me in the mouth anymore. Yeah, he wants to be helped. That's so correct. Use that. So, so I can steer the conversation because yeah. I'm really good at this and I can diffuse it when I want to. You're not going to belt me in the mouth when I'm saying to you, do you want me to help you? <laughs> yeah, because obviously there's a problem with it. So they call you and they ask you. And yeah, because yeah. in their heart they know like we're about to go out of business. Absolutely. And so I can scream and yell at them all day long and end the sentence that way. Yeah. And, and you know, that's a pretty powerful thing for them. Are you married? Yeah. Well, now, what do you like around the house? Like when you're home, are you more? Are you the same way, or are you just more like a? No, I'm much is. more mellow because I don't have a clock ticking. You know what I'm saying? I'm not taking a 24-hour day and making it an hour. 
That's where that freaking intensity comes from. In but if it's like, if it's garbage day on Monday and yeah. you know the next garbage pickup is Thursday and your wife has not put out the trash and you realize it's Tuesday morning, you don't like go, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> no, I make sure somebody else takes out the trash. Smart. <laughs> Smart. Yeah, that's, a, that's probably the right strategy. And, and you have a book. We should put, it's called Don't Bullshit Yourself. Crush the excuses that are holding you back. Uh, John is doing a, uh, a signing t uh, tomorrow at Barnes & Noble in Las Vegas. He did sign in New York last night. Yep. How was um, that? That was great, man. Yeah. People came out, right? Oh, about 120. The place was packed. It was great. That's awesome. great. So yeah, come out in Vegas. You can you can see John tomorrow. I, I don't know where in Vegas is. I don't know how many Barnes & Noble there is. There's no address in this. But go to John Taffer, no H, JohnTaffer.com or John Taffer on Twitter. I'm sure the information is there, too. What's the book about? You know, guys, I'll, I'll tell it to you quickly. This is a bit of labor of love. Two years to write this sucker. After 120-something bar rescues, I realized one day that nobody's ever looked at me and said they're failing because of me. Right. They always blame someone or something else. So I started to realize the common denominator failure excuses. Then I took it a step further and I said to myself, what the fuck is an excuse? An excuse is actually, it took me months to figure this out, a, a reconciliation of a mistake. Either you did something you shouldn't have done, you didn't do something you should have done, or you made a bad decision, or you'd never used the fucking excuse in the first place. Mm -hmm. So then excuse, excuses become the common denominator of when we freeze and don't do something we should. So then I realized, okay, if excuses are the common denominator of failure, I could change people's lives by breaking this shit down. So I took excuses, proved to you in the book that they're the paralyzing poison of moving forward, and then I picked the top six excuses that I've seen after hundreds of bar rescues and, and hundreds of down. and break them down. You know, number one is fear, for example. Because the excuse is you rely on the excuse. Like I don't have to it makes work you feel on better. Yeah, I don't have to work on the problem because yeah. it's not a problem. It's this over here is going on. Yeah, you wake up in the morning and you say to yourself, you know, my radio show sucks, but it's it's Jim's fault. I do that so, a lot. So, yeah. so why do you have to change anything? <laughs> and then he calls his, his mother and she agrees. You're yeah. right, Sam. You're marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So, but but as long as you blame him, you don't have to change. Right. But if you woke up in the morning and say, you know, this show sucks because of me, right. then you would change. So that's the whole point. We deflect it yeah. with some excuse that just makes us feel better. And it's really the core of when we fail. If we can stop ourselves from making the excuses, Let me ask you, then, does, we, then we're forced to fucking deal with it. Sure. Does, does it drive you crazy? Because it drives me crazy when you point out to somebody like, this is what you're doing. You are doing this. Like You can admit to me that you're doing this and you know you're doing this. And you get an you get an excuse back or whatever, and you realize in that moment like they're they're in the process right now of tuning you out completely. Of course, does that drive you insane? Oh yeah, and then the word but, right? So did did you put this bottle of water on the table yesterday? Uh oh yeah but, yeah, but. <laughs> so so the excuse always comes after the word but right right. Well, there's no expression. Everything after but is bullshit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's 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 where the excuse. Yeah, but no. right. that's right. Right. So you talk about fear. People are afraid of uh... a lot of things. Afraid of spending the money. Afraid of doing it. Afraid of not doing it. Fear is the biggest one. But if you think about it, whatever somebody's scared of to do, hundreds of thousands of people already fucking did. Right. So the fear is bullshit if you really think about it. You're scared of something. I mean, you guys are in front of a microphone with all these people listening. It's very easy to say, that's terrifying. I'm not going to do that. But you did. And that's the point. So fear is BS. Public speaking fear is BS. All of it is. The next one is a great one is time. I'm out of time. What a crock of shit that is. Mm -hmm. If it was important to you, you would have done it, right? Right, of course. So it isn't that you're out of time, it's that you blew it off. Right. right? So um, let's just understand the way that is. You'd stay up an extra hour at night if it was that important right. to you. You know, the other one is ego. I love this one. You ever notice the guys with the biggest ego have the thinnest fucking wallets? <laughs> I haven't uh, noticed that, uh, but I've, I've, I've noticed that the uh, guys with the biggest egos uh, have other flaws. Let's just say that. Yeah, yeah, that that too. The yeah. thinnest what? <laughs> There is, hair. there is, let's say this, there is a flaw in substance. How about yeah. that? Right. right, right, right. So, you know, so that's a really big one. The other one is, is, uh, uh, um, knowledge. Oh, I don't know enough to do this. Or I know so much that I won't fucking listen to anybody else. Right. Because right? so, I know it all. Are these the things that stop people from taking first steps towards what they want to do or that stop them in their tracks or yeah. all of the above? All of the above. Yeah. You know, if you want to do something in your life if, and you come up with an excuse that causes you not to do it, then why, why did you want to do it? Right. If you want to do it, then you got to get rid of the excuses and do it. I mean, every excuse stops you from doing what you want to do, or you wouldn't use the excuse. It is amazing right? how, how what an easy time 
people generally have figuring out everything that could go wrong or every reason why they shouldn't or right. every like that's very easy for a lot of people to do it is and you wouldn't be here if you did it right right yeah, yeah. because i mean it, because you, you just go like yeah of course all that stuff could, but who cares but that's an easy place to land yeah and it's tough to say i'm not going to be scared i'm going to go forward and do this anyway you know it's not easy but if you're conscious about it well you also have to put yourself you know, at least out you there. got a better shot i think i think also you have to put yourself out there when you want to do something and now the world or whatever's around you knows that you want to do that and i think that a lot of people don't do stuff because they don't want to admit to themselves that this is what they want and they might fail. And have other people see that failure. Right. Yep. Yeah, sometimes it's better just not to try something than it is to put in the effort and fail because you can always live in the dream of someday I'll do it, but if you try it and fail, that little dream goes away. So, so how about this? If you look back five years or more you, in your life... What was that? That's true. I know. It's but philosophical. You, it was, but I don't know what he's doing. I'm just <laughs> saying that's why people don't try sometimes. Fear, yeah. fuck everything and run. We I, can go all day. I thought it was deep <laughs> shit myself. I, I'm, I'm trying to... I think he's doing movie lines no but i can't place the movie no that's not a movie that's true i'm just i'm, I'm delivering it like an asshole but that's, oh, that's, 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 that's what i picked up on all yeah, right, I'm, being, all right I'm being a fool but it is it is true people do have that little fear See, you know what that is that's jim with a moment of true philosophy that he felt but he feared coming across like a douchebag so he delivered it like an asshole yes gotcha. yeah. that's and a there good is point. a distinct yeah. difference <laughs> There is a distinct difference. Between Absolutely. douchebag and asshole? Well, sure. well, I think douchebag is more natural. Well, asshole I'm is more one. purposeful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. We, we go back and forth. That's right. That's actually a great point. <laughs> but yeah, I've noticed that people get scared of, of, of... I think people like the idea of someday doing something. And it's scary to... Because to, once you like... Yes. Everyone likes to have that little daydream of what they're... Because I get that with people who stand up all the time. Oh, I should have done this. I should have... Right. And it is like, I know that it wasn't just you're afraid of bombing. It's you're afraid of realizing you'll never do it. And you can no longer go to that little place anymore that you right. think. But maybe suck in life. You'd rather have a no, because then you can go on. Yeah, go do something you know, maybe else. Maybe you're, you're stuck forever. Yeah. That's it. So, you know, that comedian who's in maybe mode is never going to get anywhere. No, you just got to kind of try it, and either you, you flop or you do well. You it's the same with anything. But you got to go for it. Jim Carrey, uh, and he did, I think he he talked about it in his documentary on Netflix. But the he Andy also, Kaufman one? That, that's yeah, right. That's a great, that was a great piece. It was really good, yeah. But he also talked about it in a speech that he did at one of these universities when he gave the commencement speech. And he said, like, the best lesson in his life was watching his father give up his dream to raise his family <laughs> and then get laid off. Right. Because this thing clicked in like, oh my God, like you can fail at doing what you don't want to be doing. Sure. So you might as well fail at what you, you want, want to be, be doing. doing. That's really profound when yeah, you think yeah, about yeah. it. And I was like, you can fail doing something you don't want to do. Yeah. yeah, that is a really good point. Yeah. Did this, what was his father's dream? Better kill his family. <laughs> <laughs> you know what else is something that is sort of, I had a revelation like that when I was younger. When I started doing my TV show and, and candidate, it shut down two or three times because of me. Wait, I, what'd you say? When I started doing my television show, production shut down two or three times because of me. Because I refused to fake anything. And production likes to know what is going to happen. So they yes. don't want to always fake, but they want to stage and, and cause and, and, and stimulate. I like to go in real. Sure. So, you know, I refuse to do table reads and I refuse to do the things that, you know, other reality stars required to do. And, and uh, um, I realized at that time that... I wanted to go down my way. I didn't want to fail because of the choices somebody else made. Right. Yes. And that was really powerful to me. And it's almost the same kind of a revelation that you come up with life. And after that point, then I, I never let control of anything go. And, and I feel that if I fail, I'm going to fail because of me. Right. And that I can deal with. Sure. But failing because of somebody else, I can't deal with. Do you have any editing control? And, and also, yes. is, are there things that they've taken out that you thought should have been left in or vice versa? Yeah, but I got to tell you, I have a wonderful relationship with the network. I mean, these guys are my buddies. And we, so, so, you know, I review all the cuts. Oh, you do? The, oh, yeah. And, and remember, they only see the cuts because they're never on set. I mean, you're kind so of the they biggest show on the network right now, aren't we are. you? We are. Yeah, because Spike TV, and it really came clear, Spike TV became Paramount, Paramount. Network. Yeah. And I'm like looking at the app and like what shows are on. And they have a couple shows that are, you know, from Spike TV yep. and everything. But I was like, yeah, Bar Rescue has become 
the biggest show on the network. Yeah, we have become. But but uh, 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 that closeness I have with the network and trust after 159 episodes, uh, they don't bother me. They let us do our thing, and, and they allow me to keep it real. And we've learned that we wouldn't have made it this far if it was fake. People aren't stupid. They freaking know. Yeah, people yeah. can sense it. They call it a lot of times assisted reality. But this is yeah. different because it's a new cast every week. It's, it's that's new correct. people. That's correct. And sometimes they'll overact just because that's, oh, what, no, that's what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? You know that. And they'll do that on camera. But the reality of it is, that, you know, it, it's... It's all real to me. So what do you do when you go in? I was thinking about this when I was watching the premiere of this season. Because to me, the guy like is a, a drunk. And you walk in on this guy and he's he's pissed at you. And he's like, he shoves his wife and kid out of the way. And like, that's almost getting to this place. Like, whoa, is this beyond a bar rescue show? That's But he doesn't remember it the next day. I'm like, this guy's an alcoholic. Oh, yeah. Like, that's what how I felt. Yep. And I'm going like, what do you do when you realize you're way beyond the realm of hey, suck it up, you know, get yeah. your shit together and let's get on track. And you're like, oh, this this person might be suffering from alcoholism. Yeah. Like, this is That's real. happened maybe uh, 12 times uh -huh. out, of, out of them. In all cases, either you've seen it on camera or we do it off camera, we've gotten them some kind of counseling. Oh, really? And we've brought counselors in and actually had it, uh, you know, be a segment of the show. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, we do that. Or we move them out of that management structure. Right. And in the case of, of last week, we had him working behind the bar. Right. And he wasn't drinking. All of a sudden, and he, he stopped great. drinking and he yeah, was he, good. He had purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So you tell him, sir, we believe that you're a drunkard. <laughs> and we believe your drunkenness is interfering with this business operation. Yeah. The That's other hard interesting thing about a bar <laughs> rescue stop. is that, that you got to figure, who am I fighting for? Sometimes the owner's an asshole. Right. So I'm fighting for his wife or his kids right. at home. Sometimes, you know, I'm fighting for the employees. Sometimes I'm fighting for one partner over another. I got to have something to fight for while I'm there. At the end, are they usually grateful? Or are there any of them who, like, are just ungrateful pricks? Or are most of them grateful? Uh, oh, far most are grateful. You know, maybe 10% aren't. Jim. Yeah, oh. When you're yeah. watching, you get this experience when you're watching Bar Rescue. Like, you know, usually if they're going to be an asshole the whole show, they're an, an asshole in segment two. Like, by segment two. Two. You know it. Yeah. yeah. By by the next morning, by the morning after, if they're not at least kind of cool, then you're in for something. Yeah. But like there are these moments when you're watching when they're assholes the whole time. Boy, do you root against them? And you look at your clock, and it's like 45, 50 minutes after the hour, and John hasn't started construction yet, and you're like, he's not constructing it this time. He's walking out on him. He's walking out on him, and you're just waiting for that moment when John's like, goodbye, and he leaves. So you'll so say that when, they, when they're being too difficult, you're like, we're done. We're done. I, I've walked out a couple of times. One of my favorite, though, is when we did the dugout bar a, a block from Wrigley Field in Chicago about a week before the World Series last year, two years. And uh, this owner was such an asshole that during the stress test, I only gave him one responsibility. During the hour and a half of the stress test, all you have to do is smile once. And the guy couldn't do it. <laughs> and I was a, just a complete dick, and I called him Smiling Ed throughout the episode. <laughs> and at the end of the episode, he was such a jerk that all of his employees wanted to quit. So I revealed the bar to his employees, let them all see it without him. And I had him come an hour later. When he showed up, the employees had already seen it. The employees threw the keys at him and all left. And he had a beautifully remodeled bar. I turned it into the sports room, uh -huh. right? A, a press box. A and uh, But he had no employees. And the reason why is I was a block from Wrigley Field the week before the World Series. The city of Chicago knew I was there. I had to remodel the bar. But I wouldn't open it for this asshole. So he threw the keys and walked away. Wow. So is he, he really was a dick. He was a complete and, dick. And what was he a dick that... about? Arrogant? Not thinking it was his fault? Did he just being belligerent? Entitled? Disrespectful to everyone around him. You know what I mean, Jim? One of Can those you see what guys, he looks like? I want to see what this guy is. Uh, uh, it's somebody who just disrespectful to everyone around it's him. It's called the press box? It's called the press box in Chicago. The press box in Chicago. So did you, and that's legit. So the, do, do you now help those other people find other bar gigs and stuff around Chicago? Well, yeah, I don't want to over interfere. Right. Because, you know, it's between them and their employer. But, you know, th th they can go tell of their experience and that they were trained by us and that tends to help. Yeah. Is that him? Yeah. Oh, right there next to uh, on your left. That, folks, is smiling in. <laughs> and there he is. <laughs> Do they, has anybody ever tried to sue you over how they're portrayed on the show? Oh, uh, no, not really. They probably sign away no. all that. They've had, yeah. some, they've had some bitches with the network over the years and right. stuff, but but not. But you guys are obviously, I mean, you take care of yourself yeah, before we you go do. in. So, it's not so I just didn't speak to people properly. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, he was a disrespectful son of a bitch. I mean, he'd make you feel two inches tall. I mean, the way he spoke to his employees and stuff, just a real freaking ass. So is the bar still there? 
I believe the bar is still there, yeah. Oh my God, I love this. There's two people on the <laughs> phone right now, and this is how you know you have a clan. What, don't, without looking at the phone screen, do you know what you're like, because it's in, in my head, if you said what's the classic <laughs> episode of Bar Rescue, I would have the same answer as those two people on the phone. Do you know what one it is? Pirates. That's it. You got it. <laughs> Everybody man's on pirates. I don't which was know the worst week of my life, man. That was. Uh... I mean, it's you know why it's incredible, and I won't spoil it because we'll probably get into it in these stories. But the it's my favorite. You know that they do text at the end of the episode. They do it, reveal the new bar, blah blah blah, and then they do text of how the bar's doing it. Almost every single time, it's food and drink are up twenty percent. Uh, attendance is up this percent. Like almost every time, it's good news. <laughs> The pirate bar was just, um, the, the text at the end of the episode was just amazing. I don't remember what it said. What did it say? It's so, so John goes into this pirate bar, <laughs> right? And he's like, this is insane. Like they're doing no business, but they're all acting like pirates. There's no customers in there. Hey, matey. But they're all acting like pirates and they're insisting. And John goes, well, first you have to get rid of this theme. Like you can't. You don't think pirates are a good theme for a restaurant? Uh, not in, not in uh, 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 Maryland. Right, it made downtown. No, it made you know, no maybe sense. Maybe St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> and it was like it was like old. It wasn't like fun, like young pirates either. It was like older people, and they were just yeah. doing this pirate thing. And but this was deep, though, Jim. These oh. people were pirates twenty four hours a day. Right. When I put them in civilian like clothes, asses. they could not speak non pirate. Right. Right. <laughs> and so and so they're 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 going through this. And half the episode, it takes John arguing that they can't be pirates anymore, and they're arguing that they should be pirates. And they go and they go and they go. Finally, we get to the end of the episode. They're not pirates anymore. John goes in. He redoes the whole bar. All these new people are coming in. You think it's a happy ending. And then the text comes up on the screen that says two weeks later they turned it back into a pirate bar. Oh, yeah, and they burned the sign. Yeah. They've had a YouTube video of them sitting around the fire burning the sign and cursing me in pirate. <laughs> <laughs> Can we see that? <laughs> I want to see him being cursed. And Why were they mad? Were they a family? Uh, uh, they just were pirates 24 hours a day. All they wanted to be was pirates. Yeah, they were. I know it's, it's a hard thing to conceive, but it was true. Uh, uh, they wanted to be pirates. Yeah, and they were, they were offended. They were offended that John came in and thought that that was not a good business there it approach. Is. It's respectful and insulting that they would burn down all the tools <laughs> I gave them. In all my years as a bar consultant, I've come up against people who challenge my ideas, but Pirate's Tavern is the only one who outright threw them in the trash. <laughs> I want to hear someone talking pirate. Just burning hey, down the sign. Hey, matey. Ah. Oh, ah. Now, how, Did they really say that? And they, they call you like, matey? Yeah, and they spoke, yes. But they had this accent of like the 1800s. And when you look, I'd go, because I would go out and look in their cars in the parking lot. All they had was pirate clothes. Oh, my God. I mean, it was really they like. They were pirate. It was like, hours a day. It, but it was like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean Pirates, like a Disney ride. Yes. Yeah. But like a cheap version. Yep. Yeah. And then Tracy and and her husband uh, uh, Gi Giuciano right. came in to a back to the bar episode with me later on, and they opened a bar in Florida now called Bar Recluse or something. But I've actually heard from them, and we've uh, kissed and made up since. Good. Good. The, the pirate people. The pirate people. But the new bar is not a pirate bar. The Florida bar is not a. Pirate. I have no idea. You it's, don't even want to know. No, it's, you that's don't even want to ask. Let me hear them talking pirate. Are they talking yeah. pirate in real Let's see. No, it's not funny at all. That's good to hear. There is a grown man yelling at the top of his lungs at people who aren't children. Um, dressed up as pirates. Well, you're dressed like a six-year-old child. I wouldn't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like an arrogant ass. I am one. Let him push me too far. We'll see. I do this now, this was a gentleman named oh, One-Eyed Mike. One -eyed. Six -year -old over it makes me angry. Still talking like he's, he's angry. He's angry, Jim. Angry, Jim. He's going to make me put on a shirt and a tie. No. It's a pirate bar. That's not his real accent, Jim. No, it's not. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> Are you I'm uncomfortable, uncomfortable with it? Yes, I am. <laughs> you got so, it. It's the best. It's, it's, it's I'm amazing. very uncomfortable. So, it was a strange for you to watch. Imagine what it was like for me to live it, man. It was, it was unbelievable. <laughs> Are you sitting there like looking around like waiting for the other shoe to drop? Like this has oh, yeah. to be like a put on or... Yeah. But one-eyed Mike who had the patch really had one eye. Sure. A and you want to know how he lost his eye? Playing pirate in a sword fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> come on! I'm telling you the truth. You can't make this shit up. So, so that was he's, he said it in the episode. Yeah, but he he lost his eye playing pirate in a sword fight. Oh my how, god! How old? 
As an adult? As an adult, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, as an adult, Jim. What a silly question. What do you, now, what do you do like when you go to like a, you, the restaurant and it's like just dingy and run down, but then the back bar, like the office area is all shitty. Do you work on that or only where the people are going to see it? No, we work, we work uh, 36 hours, so, so you know, you we can't see. do it. We focus on the customer areas and, and, and the kitchen, set them though. Up. I mean, you should see these kitchens. Oh, yeah, we spend a lot of money in the kitchen. Oh, yeah. my God. Have you seen roaches in these places? <laughs> oh, man. Roaches. One of my cooks, one of my chefs was in an episode in Florida. Uh, uh, and a, a rat ran into his foot as he stayed. He looks down, there's a rat next to his foot. So I put a GoPro cameras underneath the cooking equipment and left it overnight, and there were rats running all over the place all Did night they want long. you to put GoPros under their uh, thing, or they, they were not happy about that? I'm sure they weren't happy about they that. Preferred then it was not. another one where we had a raccoon in the ceiling. I remember that one. And, and the raccoon was up in the drop ceiling and a was live... shitting all over the freaking bar. It was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can't like, make this shit. How'd they get it? And, and you see it, like you see the shit, and John just goes, "What's that?" And it and, just and it the reveal in. is that there's a raccoon that lives in the ceiling of the bar where there's a kitchen and they serve food. So how did uh, how did you get the raccoon to stop going duty all over the food? <laughs> we, we had we had to get exterminators in. You know, to deal with the raccoon. They hadn't thought to do that while there was an animal shitting on the well, food. Well, <laughs> no, obviously not. And then the issue is raccoons. You can't just kill a raccoon. You get you got to. Put it back in the way. You got yeah. To, so there's a whole process of you know you uh, got to get the right guy. So, they're friendly though. You can just kind of put your hand up and he'll come over. Uh, I don't and come think down. so. I think they're pretty nasty. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. oh, do you and you do you kind of get an inkling when you're in a kitchen in the middle of the day with the lights on and a rat is brazen enough to walk out and touch your foot? Do you kind of get a feeling that there might be a few more? Oh yeah, you're uh, uh, without a doubt. You're on their turf now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they're not on your turf anymore. So what do you do? You got to obviously you got to exterminate, but then you have to seal up, like, seal up all the little holes oh, in the yeah, areas. Absolutely. Like, you have to move every piece of equipment, Put right? Wall, new wall panel, and you bet. You know, exterminate yeah, because, the place. It's a food operation. So, so you've so. seen a lot of places that were roach infested. Oh yes, dude. Yes. He's been. There's like larva in the ice in these bars that he goes to. In the bottles. In well, the bottle, you hold up the bottle of alcohol that they're serving. On the soda guns. What? Oh, what is it that fucking flies go in there and drop their eggs? Yeah, because they, they they go to they go to a sugar, and, and then there's fruit flies everywhere, and then there's cockroaches. How do you, when you look at some flies? of these bottles? You can actually see the carcasses. And these bars have been serving it for Lord knows how long. They've been yeah. using those bottles, right? And they don't even look. They don't notice. Well, they don't care. They see it. We need to do it. Well, that's yes. Yeah, so that's why they're failing. What's yeah. the best way for people to keep cockroaches and fruit flies off their shit? <laughs> Clean it the fuck up, man. <laughs> Clean it every day. You know they're 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 not attracted to cleanliness. <laughs> you should have seen. Dude, the, the the premiere episode, the thing that skeeved me out was there's like a big cutting board in the back. And I takes, hate those two. No, that's guy, oh, guy who thinks he knows where you're going. Yeah. Oh. He takes his knife and he just starts scraping along the whole top of it. And this thick layer of yellow of just a cutting board that is never Washed and there's raw chicken put it's on it. Bacteria and every, it's a bacteria colony, yeah. man. It's disgusting. It's gr <laughs> there was there was black mold on the cutting board. Then they take raw chicken, they cut it, and then they put cooked chicken right back where the raw chicken was. Sure. And then they pick up raw chicken with their hands, and then they pick up lettuce and put it in your salad with your hands. So you're eating raw chicken with your salad. But is that salad. good? It'll, it'll <laughs> freaking kill you, man. That's what he said. He goes, he goes, this kitchen isn't going to make someone sick. This kitchen is going to kill someone. And it could. It could. So yeah. what did you make him do? Get rid of all their shit? I made him clean up. <laughs> uh, I, that night, he cleaned his kitchen. And then, you know, what you don't see on TV is I make them clean the entire kitchen. I make them work all night long. And then at about 6 in the morning, I have a cleanup crew arrive. And after they've worked and proven to me that they'll do it, then I make sure it's clean right with a, with a cleaning crew. Does the cleaning crew right. usually do a better job? There's always something extra to do because he only has five, six hours. You know, I get sure. out of there at 11. But, you know, I want to make him do it. And as I tell him, I want you to wallow in the grease because it's fucking yours. Yeah. yeah. So I force him to do it and get dirty and disgusting. But at the end of the night, I got to make sure it's right. So I send my people and to do it. And disinfect it. And yeah, and all yeah. that right. Do you have right. people that travel with you or do you get a local crew? I have a crew of 57 to travel with me. I mean, how many in the cleaning crew? A uh, oh, cleaning crew is local contractors that you we use. You just do local yeah, people. Yeah, we have PAs and stuff that'll do it too. But we bring in typically a professional cleaning company to do the kitchens. Okay, so they have to move everything and just get it. And steam clean everything and all that kind of stuff. You bet. Is that how you clean equipment? You steam clean it? It depends upon what piece of equipment it is. But sometimes you steam clean. Other times you can damage it if you steam clean it. Let's go to, uh, you want to go to line three there? This is a good one too. Nick in Detroit. Sure. Hey, Nick. Hey, Nick. Hey, hey man. buddy. Hey, uh, John, I wanted to ask you a question. You did an episode in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, I live not too far from there. It's called Chicks on Dicks. Um, <laughs> it's the name of the bar. You know that's, Chicks on like Dicks. It's like the kind of place that Jimmy would hang out at. It certainly um, is. You know from the, well, Chicks with Dicks, probably. <laughs> hey, you know from the onset 
that that place was going to fail because that place is a freaking rump chef. Yeah, you know, the, uh, there was no question. I know it when I leave. You know, we have, uh, there's this independent website called Bar Rescue Updates that tracks us. Mm -hmm. And they have us at about a 70% success factor, which I'm proud of. Yeah. So I have no issue talking about the other 30%. Honestly, when I walk out, I know most of the time if they're going to fail or not. You just see it in their attitudes. But there was th that place didn't have a shot. I thought what I created was sort of fun. They could have created a fun, high-energy topless bar, but my guess is they didn't go with it at all. Yeah, I mean, that's what no, like... John won't like go. He doesn't go in with any like moral. This is distasteful. This is what he looks at the community. He looks at what the what's going to work in the building. And if if a topless bar is the way to go, let's do a topless bar. If it's going to be a and that was a right. metal bar, let's yeah. do a metal bar. Like, this was going to be right across the street from a huge auto plant in an industrial area. You mm -hmm. know, if that's what was the right concept for it, and that's what we did. We tried to do it right, though. All right, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I've been to I've been to one of the bars that got rescued. I ended up going. In New Orleans, spirits on bourbon. Yeah, that was yeah, it was right oh, on bourbon. You went to New went to Nolans. Why do you say it like New that? Can I say it so, proper? So, so you know that the chair in, in uh, spirits on bourbon, I'm told now by the tourism association, is the second most photographed thing on bourbon. Street. Really? Yeah. Why? Uh, well, I created this bar, and the biggest challenge that I have yeah, is how right. to create you know a new I concept with, every I went time. with Kevin and Maria Menounos. Oh, well, they're, yes, 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 well, they're my dear friends. You know that. Yes, of course. So, so uh, um, I had to create this bar, Jim, and, and you know what concept do you do? So I asked my team to go on the internet and find the history of this building. It's 300 years old, and I find out it was owned by a barber who had a wife and like six girlfriends, and one of the six girlfriends killed him in the building. So from that, I created, his name was Edward Dubois. From that, I created Spirits on Bourbon, the barbershop chair, because yep. he was a barber, and the Resurrection Cocktail. And they sell 16,000 Resurrection Cocktails a month. Wow. And, and they go through about six or seven liters of alcohol in that barbershop chair every night. So people, now who sits in the chair? Just who, if it's open, someone just it's drops a, well, into it? you know, if you're a guy, there's, there, there's a well-endowed female who will pour the shot directly into your mouth when she lays you back on a chair. Oh, okay, and so it's a whole it, thing. And there's a guy who will do it for girls, and it's a whole thing. You lay in the yeah. chair, you take your shot, and you get a photograph at the, in the chair on Bourbon Street. So it's, it's popular now. It's really popular, yeah. yeah. What a great idea to invest. How old was the building? The building was about two or 300 years old. But how long ago that guy got biggest, killed? Oh, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. But it was an old story that we found in the building. But all you need is one little thread like that. You sure. Can take that one little tidbit and turn the whole concept around it. Yeah, because yeah. you can, it's like, what else do you do with it? Okay, let's find something that was really ha here. Yep. And it's a, do they tell, how do people know what that story is? They ask about it? Uh, well, we, we yes, they can ask about it. But the resurrection cocktail, what does that come from? Well, you know, we're hoping Edward Dubois gets resurrected. You know, he's the barber who, and it all connects. And it's an Sick. interesting story. It's amazing when you watch how many people just have no clue about the business that they're in at all. Like they just opened a bar, they started it on a, on a lark or whatever it was. Like there was one I was watching where, they're, where, where John's going, okay, what's the rent on this place? And the lady goes like four grand or whatever. And he goes, okay, well, in order to make money in the bar business, you need to make 10 times your rent. Good memory. And yep. she's like a month. And he's like, yeah, so you need to be making $40,000 a month. That's right. And she goes, oh, and, he, and she looks kind of panicked. And he goes, why? How much are you bringing in a month? And she goes like $18,000. That's not good. And you're like, no. what, there's she no goes, business here. This, you know, product, you know, uh, liquor is 20, 25%. Labor is 30%. So if, if you don't do 10 times your rent, the numbers don't work. Right. So it's very easy to say, you know, what is the rent in the bar? I got to do 10 times that every month. And when they look at that number, you know, it, it can be quite intimidating. Yeah. It's just so far away from it. What is I the most successful two in the country? I thought one of them is, a, it's a gay place on Santa Monica called the Abbey. They, someone told me it's the most successful bar in the country. And the second is Jimmy Buffett's place in uh, Margaritaville in Vegas. I disagree with both. Oh, you do? Okay. The and, you know, I used to run nightclub and bar convention in Vegas, and we always had the hop, top 100 list. And I'll tell you approximate numbers. Uh, uh, excess in Las Vegas at Wynn will do about $70 million this year. Oh, Buffett my God. As a, as a bar? As a bar nightclub. Wow. Buffett will do about 34. So wow. they're doubling them. Marquee in Las Vegas this year will probably do $80 million, which is almost tripling what Buffett's doing. So, so you know, a uh, uh, Hakkasan will come in at about $60 million in Vegas. So the highest producing beverage operations in the world are typically those three. And, and very few cities can touch them. Now, you know, there's a marquee here in New York. Because everyone drinks in Vegas. But it, but it doesn't do at all the numbers sure. that a marquee in Vegas well, does. Well, you're vacationing there, you're going out doing shows, you're gambling, you're yeah, getting yeah. loaded, it's, it's okay. Whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna do more of in Vegas. Too. Yeah, that's you're, true. You're gonna drink more, party more, 
Well, Sit more. You know, I mean, is, everything you think. They have the most successful bars in the world to be in Vegas. They do, yeah. Does that mean Vegas is a good place to open a bar, or are they kind of getting the... Well, there's, there's, it's competitive. Yes. You know, when we opened the one on Bourbon Street, there's 57 bars in three blocks. They close all the time. People think you open a bar on Bourbon Street. It's, it's really competitive, mm -hmm. even though there's a lot of people there. Sure. There's a lot of great competition, so you got to know what you're doing in those markets. Right. And Mardi Gras is only for a short period of time. It's not That's correct. Only a few days a year. That's right. Not the entire year. And I guess, well, Wynn's amazing, though. I mean, despite his personal troubles, like, th that's a great hotel. And uh, it, it's new. It's what is it? Eight years old? Ten yeah, years old? It's, it's a beautiful property, and you know, it was, I was sad to see all that happen because he was a great developer, and he was very philanthropic in Las Vegas. Are they still building there as rapidly? Because I know for a while they slowed down. And uh, like, Atlanta, what happened to Atlantic City? Like, Atlantic City is just awful. Like, they had the Revel, the Revel or Revel, whatever it's called, is just yeah. standing there. Yeah, you know, Atlantic City, you know, when they built it, they, they probably should have put a little uh, parentheses under the word Caesar's Palace and put like. Yeah. Because, you know, the Caesars Palace in Atlantic City is nothing like the Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. It's just a very different marketplace. And then you look at Mohegan Sun, you know, who's really taking their business away with an amazing facility. Foxwoods, where I'll be this tomorrow night. Hey. Is, is another one. You'll Great entertainment. Foxwoods. Great facility. <laughs> and, you know, they take that business away from so Jersey's got some serious competition. Yeah, well, you know what it is, because it was only legal there in Vegas. And now New York's talking about doing it. I mean, they're stupid not to have it in Manhattan. They're giving oh, away yeah. millions of dollars, which could help fucking alleviate everyone's taxes. Yes. Let, let people just gamble. I'm sure that's what they're going to do with the money. When they put gambling in, that's what they're going to do, Jim. They're going to alleviate your taxes with all that money. Yeah, that's probably very naive of me. That was very... <laughs> that, thank you for pointing. That was very <laughs> eager boyish of me. Gee, and we'll pay less, won't we, mister? <laughs> yeah, shithead, that's how it works. I really am stupid. <laughs> fucking naive idiot, I'm 50. <laughs> What's it like to be... Uh, to have this kind of fame at this point in your life, because for a long time you're super. Not you, Jim. Oh. You're still. You're still. You're still grabbing. That's what I thought you meant. My it. mediocre level. Yeah. <laughs> you you've worked so hard and achieved so little. So, like you know, <laughs> you've been successful in business for a long time, and so people in that world know you. But this is a totally different thing. I mean, yeah. you know, this is this is your your face is everywhere. And when I say that Bar Rescue is the biggest show on on Paramount Network, it's also because. It's on all the time. Yeah, so like, those marathons on Sunday. Right, right. Oh, trust me, I know. So, so what is it like now? Does it affect business? Is it more difficult on a personal level to not be able to kind of walk around anonymously? Well, that's an issue. You know, yeah. I'm not. I've, I'm a little uncomfortable with celebrity, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. You know, being in radio, you guys will get noticed quite as much as right. the TV guys. Not do. even here. <laughs> no, you know, you know and, I, and I did a project with Cheryl Crow, and we were standing on a street corner, and everybody's driving by screaming my name. And, you know, I was a little embarrassed by it. They right. And she goes, you know, it's really interesting. People know my music, but they know your face. Right. You know, and there's just a difference. And, and so, so, you know, celebrity is a little strange. Mm -hmm. you know, it comes to you late in life, you know, it used to. But this particular week has blown me away. I'm on a cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. It's a big freaking deal to yeah. me. Season six of Bar Rescue premiered last week. And my book came out two days ago. And Which, then by my the way, book, whose face is on the cover of that book? Th my face. That's, That's a right. hell of a face, isn't That's it? a great face. Don't then, bullshit yourself. It's called just to promote it. Tomorrow he's doing a signing in Las Vegas if you want to go see him at Barnes & Noble. Thanks, Jim. And uh, uh, two days ago, I did an episode of Dr. Phil where Dr. Phil held that book up and said everybody in America should buy it, which is a big deal because he doesn't do that very often. What was Dr. So Phil like a as, as, as a guy? I've always wondered about Dr. Phil because sometimes he seems like... He's a legit dude, and then other times he seems like he's just trying to capitalize off something. Well, in full disclosure, I must tell you, he's my friend. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually having lunch with him today. Well, uh, that's uh, even, uh, then you're even more of a, a person with some knowledge. Of well, him. he is a friend, and I'm going to tell you, he's, he's one of the greatest guys I know. I'm really? With you, one of the greatest guys I know. Does he, do you think there is that part of him, like, you know, not to take anything away from what he does, but that, that Carnival Barker part of him where he's putting on a show, and he's like, oh, this person is going to make great TV. Let's suck the great TV out of him. So are you going to bring somebody in there who does shitty radio? Oh, every no. time, <laughs> each other. Yeah. So isn't that what we do? Of course. I mean, once our job, once we get in front of the camera, is to tell compelling stories. Right. So, you know, I, we can say this guy's going to make great TV. You know, I, would, I, would, I think he's going to probably use the term, this is a compelling story. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think he's looking at it that way. And well, there is something to be said for that. You have to, because if even if it's just helping people and it sucks on TV, that it's going to bomb and the network's not going to keep it. Right. I That's mean, right. I, I mean, America's Most Wanted, John Walsh's show. You're never going to do a more valuable show than that. And they let it go because the ratings weren't quite what they wanted. Yeah, he was somebody right. else for it, and he, they canceled it. He was literally trying to catch people who kill kids, and like that's ah, just not doing the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they wound up bringing it back in some other. Uh, they changed it a little bit, but it doesn't matter how noble your show is. Right. If they don't like. The numbers, right. fuck them. They're That's gonna right. drop you. Yeah, it's a business. But people, I mean, he's he's a machine. I mean, mm -hmm. He's a daytime monster in television ratings. There's oh, a yeah. why, and there's a reason why. Yeah, yeah. 
Do you look at guys like, is that why you, a guy like you just keeps working and working and working? Because, you know, these bar rescue shows, and I think, I think I talked to you about this last time we talked. If you watch them, there's a lot more production elements to them than an average reality show. Like there is a lot put into each episode. I mean, I'm, and I'm just sitting there like, you spend I mean, a lot of money. Right. And even just, like, and it takes time and like, there's like, you know, things and you do so, you did 160 episodes so mm -hmm. far. Like there's a ton of these episodes, you're putting out books, you've also got business that's not on TV. Like, it's a lot. It is a lot. Right now we're developing a huge resort in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee on a whole mountain with attractions and two hotels and restaurants, convention facilities, uh, uh, rides and amusements. We're uh, reinventing the customer experience in the largest hardware chain in America. Jeez. And doing a bunch of other things. So is that like, do you, do you, <laughs> look at guys like Dr. Phil and you look at people like Kevin and Maria and go like, this is what we do. We just keep going, keep going, keep going. And that does that motivate you to keep going? Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's a challenge and it's fun. Right. New projects are fun. Right. Tennessee, is that where Dollyland is? About a mile away, you bet. Dollywood. Dollywood. Sorry, Dollywood. yeah. I, uh, you know, we're all big Dolly Parton fans at heart. Let's be really honest. I'm a fan. How can you not be? Of course. <coughs> Let me tell you something interesting. She's the largest employer in that county in Tennessee. Is she? Because of Dollywood? Because not only Dollywood, she has attractions, hotels, Dollywood, her stampede, which is the dinner theater kind of a concept. When you said she is a, 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 Unbelievable employer and people love her. When you what? said Dolly Parton and largest, I didn't think you were going with employees after that. No, no. <laughs> I, no. Have she's you heard rather of greatest a... hits? <laughs> <laughs> she's, a, she's a busty young lady. I've noticed. Have she, you? She's yeah. She's great. What yes. is Dollywood? The, the, the music park. Oh, it it's is a theme park. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's Dolly Parton's theme park. Yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. popular. Very. Yeah, it's wow. right. I, I, I there it is. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's in Tennessee. It's a little bit outside of Nashville. Like it's in, it's in its own area, but yeah, yeah. closer to Knoxville. Yeah. yeah, I've been to Nashville. I've never been to Nashville. I want to go there and I want to go see Yakov Smirnov's place. We've talked about that. In Branson. 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 Yeah. Have you been to Branson? I've not been to Branson. But I'll tell you a funny story. I many years ago I worked in Grossinger's in the Catskill Mountains, which was a resort. Right. And Smirnov worked there. He was a waiter. Oh, really? really? Yeah. Was that before he did comedy? <laughs> yes. Wow. And remember, all the all the Casco comedians would come up there. Yeah, who'd you, well, that's got to be in the 70s, right? That was in, uh, uh, no, uh, 79, 80, 81, in okay. that range. But we had all the Casco comics coming up there all the time. So, I don't think I know so any of those guys. What, are they guys that are mainstream or no? Uh, they're guys, no, they're older now. You know, all those Casco comedians, but guys like Buddy Hackett. Oh, yeah, okay. You know, yeah. Freddie Roman, yeah, yeah, sure. Mousy Lawrence, you know, that all those kind of guys. Yeah. Yeah. I never got to go to Dollywood, but I did, when I was a kid, a few times, I went to Opryland. Do you know Opryland? That's of course. The, that's the theme park right outside where the Grand Ole Opry was. And it's gone now. It's gone. The Grand Ole Opry's gone? Or the theme park's gone? The, theme well, the park's hotel gone. is there, which the whole, is an yeah. amazing place. Right. The, the Opryland, the Gaylord property, but the <gasps> theme park's gone. Yeah, Opryland, Opryland's gone. But wait, it was... Uh, the, wait, the, you mean the theme park's the gone? The theme park's gone. Yeah, yeah, not the actual place. The Opera House. No, no, no the Opry Opry House Land is, there. is the theme park. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the place they sing is there. Um, the Grand Old Opry. Yeah. All right. Do you want to... the word Opry. <laughs> I fucking hate it. You want to go to line three there? That's uh, sure. Chuck in Boston. Hello, That's a great Chuck. Question. How are you? All right. How are you guys doing? Good, Good. buddy. Hey, I just want to know that the, the show that whoever pays for you to go make these bars over, once they're more successful to the show, or you personally profit from the success on a, you know, monetarily... No, we have no financial connection to them whatsoever. You know, so you I don't do take is, an ownership. ownership. No, thanks, they, Chuck. And they don't owe us anything. You know, we we, wow. we sign everything over to them that we gave them, and uh, uh, no, we leave. This is all just for you them. Just, it, it, it's a one-time interaction, and at the end of it, you're both done. They own Correct. what they own. You own the footage, and we go to the next one. <laughs> it's so funny because there are other reality shows like uh, I watch. Uh, what's it called? The Prophet on MSNBC, and I always think it's funny because that guy takes a much more. He doesn't yell. You know what I mean? And he's not like, he's not in your face and everything. But what he does do is like the whole premise of the show is he gets these businesses back on their feet, but he takes like 50% of the business. Right. Like that's the whole right. Well, is he deal. putting like, money in? Yeah, oh, oh you guys are putting money in too. Yeah, they not, We take no percentage though. We right. just give it to you. Right. It's a gift. It is a gift technically. So yeah. is the bill, now that sounds like a silly question, but if you're doing it in 36 or 48 hours, is the stuff, because I know how long construction takes, is, is the, the stuff constructed as, I mean, obviously it's going to be, but how do they do it as well as it should be done if it's so fast? To rip well, stuff out takes a while. Put shit in takes a while. It's, it's, the, it's the quality of the materials that you use. You know, if you do stone on a wall, that ain't going anywhere. 
right? If you put cheap paneling on a wall, people are going to push their pens through it. Right. So I got to use the right materials, but that's years of doing this, Jim. You know, so I've been you know, building bars my whole life. So these are commercial construction projects, not built like home extreme makeovers. Right. You know, you're not building it like your bedroom in a house.